Well, Fred, today we have two distinguished guests from our UFO conference. We have Stanton Friedman and Kathleen Martin. So this is a very special day for this show on this network to have the caliber of speakers that we have here on, on this show. What we want to talk about is we want to talk about Majestic 12 and Roswell with Stanton, and we want to talk about the Betty and Barney Hill case, and then your, your involvement in the abduction field and running that for, for MUFON with Kathleen Martin. So uh, let, let's, start off, let's start off with Stanton. And uh, <clears throat> this, the MJ-12, and I actually have some, some documents here. This is obviously you've seen. Yeah. You get this, Fred. Can I ask one question first? Yeah, good. What got you interested in UFOs? All right, that's good. Let's start that way. Yeah. Well, I was working as a <clears throat> nuclear physicist for General Electric in Cincinnati on the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Program, and my wife and I were ordering books from a mail-order bookhouse, and I needed one, I'm a cheapskate, I need one more book so I wouldn't have to pay shipping. And there on this list was the report on unidentified flying objects by Captain Edward Ruppelt, who headed Project Blue Book in the early 50s. This was in 1958. So I ordered the book because it was $2.95, hardcover, <laughs> marked down to a dollar. So it wasn't going to cost me anything because shipping would have been a dollar. Right. So I read the book. I was intrigued. I, one of my thoughts was that the Air Force was a co-sponsor of our program. The A&P program was a big program. We spent $100 million in 1958. We employed 3,500 people, of whom 1,100 were engineers and scientists. We're not talking about a little study off in the corner kind of thing. And I thought, gee, uh, if these things are real, maybe they use nuclear energy and it would help our program, <laughs> you know, nuclear-powered airplanes kind of thing. So I, I shared the book with a neighbor, Charlie, uh, who was an engineer 10 years older than I was, and he was more impressed than I was, and that impressed me because I was impressed with right. Charlie. So I'm, we each went our own way uh, off to California, and he moved someplace else. I saw him at a conference 10 years later where I was speaking to a bunch of electrical engineers. First thing he and his wife said was, we knew you when you didn't believe in flying saucers, <laughs> which was hmm. kind of neat. So uh, I moved to California, and the real turning point was when I found a copy of Project Blue Book, special report number 14. Largest study ever done on flying saucers for the US Air Force. And it hadn't been mentioned in any of the 10 books that I'd read by that time, which was a little strange. Why didn't anybody mention them? And what really bugged me, the guy included the press release that went out in 1955. You can see it's official, you know, Air Force and all right. that sort of stuff. Quoting the Secretary of the Air Force, he said, on the basis of this study, we believe that no objects such as those properly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. I feel certain that even the unknown 3% could have been explained as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been available. Well, that hit me over the head because I had the report. It's loaded with charts, tables, graphs, maps, all kinds of goodies. The unknowns weren't 3%, they were 21.5%. That's mm -hmm. a flat out lie. Also, the report has a cross comparison between unknowns and knowns. The probability that the unknowns, looking at six different characteristics, were just misknowns, was less than 1%. The better the quality of the sighting, the more likely to be unexplainable. So I was really shook up by, I don't like being lied to, but especially by the Secretary of the Air Force. Uh, and this was full of lies. So I got determined I'm going to find out more about this. And I joined APRO and NICAP, the two major groups back right, right. then, to get their newsletters and stuff like that. But I was bound and determined to find out what's going on. I mean, I had a security clearance. I'm accustomed to, sometimes you got to walk a little carefully around certain pieces of information. But flat out lying, I just didn't like. Uh, another thing, the press release doesn't mention who did the work. Right. Patel Memorial Institute doesn't give the names of any of the people, didn't give the title of the report. If somebody had said, if they had said Project Blue Book Special Report 14, surely some newsman would have said, hey, what happened to 1 through 13? <laughs> we haven't heard anything about them. Right. So this straightforward <laughs> deception bugged me. I don't mind keeping secrets. I had a clearance for 14 years. Mm. I don't like being lied to. The American people have been lied to consistently about this. So that got me involved. And 
you know, I got started right here in Pittsburgh in my public activities. That's what we hear. Well, yeah, I, I uh, had read Frank Edwards' book, Flying Saucer's Serious Business. Right. I was working then in Indianapolis where he was based. And I got a job at Westinghouse here, Astronuclear Lab, Nuclear Rockets. Very exciting. Uh, interesting work, too. And I called Frank and I said, uh, Frank, you know everybody. Give me some names here in Pittsburgh. I want to go public. Uh, Westinghouse nuclear physicists, those are gold-plated credentials, it oh. says here. He gave me the name of the producer of the contact show on KDKA. And when I called them, it was, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> Complete deflation. Less than a month later, I get a call at 6.30 p.m. Uh, could you please do tonight's show at 7 o'clock? Somebody canceled at the last right. minute. And I've often wondered, maybe somebody listening knows, how many people did they call before they got to me to do <laughs> the show? And I lived not too far from the station. So I did the show. Somebody at work at Westinghouse heard me on the show and asked if I would speak to her book review club. My first lecture was in somebody's living room uh, talking about Frank's book as a starting right. place. And that led to a lot more lectures. We had an active group, UFO Research Institute, here in Pittsburgh. Right. And uh, KDKA was really nice to me. When the Condon Report came out, they got an advanced copy, and they said, we'll give it to you if you'll appear on the program. <laughs> they didn't tell me it was 865 pages. <laughs> but what I found was that there was such a good response from people that I respected. People think that uh, nobody believes in flying saucers, mm -hmm. scientists don't believe in it, and so forth. Well, I'm driving to work with Joanne, who was a supervisor at Westinghouse, and I said, gee, I'd like to uh, be at Carnegie Mellon, speak at Carnegie Mellon. Well, did you talk to the dean? No, I talked to Dr. So-and-so, and he wasn't interested. She said, well, the dean's my husband, Stan. He's heard you on the radio. Give him a call. Yeah. I called. We booked a talk. And one of those little quirks, last question he asked, it was an afternoon talk. I knew I'd have to take some time off work. He said, uh, how much do you want? How about $100, thinking he'd cut me down to 50. <laughs> and then he told me, because I knew his wife, what he was paying the other speakers in the series, 1500 1700 wow. <laughs> The talk went so well that he wrote a nice letter to the agent through whom he had booked these other speakers. <laughs> they booked me at the Engineering Society of Detroit. $300 in expenses. We had 1,008 people for dinner and a talk, and there wasn't one negative question. That impressed me. Oh, yeah. Be... And I had other calls, and one of the big turning points was Los Alamos. I had business with them on the nuclear rocket program, radiation shielding my counterpart there. Hey, Stan, I understand you're giving lectures. Yeah, how about talking to the local section of the American Nuclear Society? Fine. You know, I mean on an expense account, Stan. <laughs> i got to talk to management about that. You know. <laughs> they paid for me to go from Pittsburgh to Los Alamos, New Mexico, to give a lecture, Flying Saucers Are Real. We didn't hide it behind technical discussions, you know. We had well over 400 people, no negative questions. Well, I was impressed with these people being so responsive. These were people I had to respect. I was still young, you know. So I got involved. I found that people liked what I had to say. I've had 11 hecklers and well over 700 lectures. Wow. And you talk, you've got that many if you talk about sports, religion, politics. You know that, John. Mm. Uh, and so I'm not a masochist. I don't do this to get eggs <laughs> you know, thrown at me. Uh, I've spoken in all 50 states, in 10 provinces, and in 19 other countries. There is interest around the world and acceptance around the world. I've only had 11 hecklers, and two of them were drunk. That's good. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to encourage people. It's, it's OK to talk about this. Yeah. Basic rule, have facts in hand before putting mouth in gear. Don't say things that aren't true. You know, you don't want to be tripped up by somebody saying, well, that's not true here. So it, it's been an interesting experience. It'll be 50 years next year since my first lecture here in Pittsburgh. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm glad I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> so wait. <laughs> At least for this weekend. <laughs> it's a pleasure having you here back in Pittsburgh. You also spoke at St. Vincent's College in Latrobe, right? Yes. I've spoken at 
lots of colleges and lots of places. I mean, locally in this yeah. area. Yeah. Uh, and the Gulf Research Labs Management Club and places like that. Hmm. Um, there's widespread interest in this subject. And I've spoken to sections of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, there is widespread interest by respectable people. Good. And I, I say that to encourage people to tell us what they've learned, what they've seen. I haven't had a sighting. I got to depend on other people. Mm. All right. Hey, Kathleen, since we're on this, how'd you get started? Tell us your story. <laughs> what you, got you started? Well, I was 13 years old, and my aunt and uncle, Betty and Barney Hill, uh, had gone on a short vacation. And when they returned home, my aunt called my mother and told my mother that they had had a close encounter with a flying saucer wow. the previous evening in New Hampshire's White Mountains. They were very, very concerned because the craft was so close to them that they were afraid they had been contaminated. We had a neighbor who was a physicist, and my mother offered to call the physicist to see what Betty and Barney should do and what kind of radiation they might have been exposed to. And that's how it all started. Within a couple of days, my family and I traveled to their house. I saw evidence um, that was very perplexing and troubling to them, that something had happened physically to them. And I met most of the investigators along the way through the years. Uh, Alan Hynek, Benjamin Simon, Walter Webb, uh, a number of different investigators, Jacques Vallée, mm -hmm. and who had actually come to my childhood home or to my aunt and uncle's house. And uh, I was intrigued. I thought maybe I would like to do that when, when I grew yeah. up. And I cause went to college and my background is, was in sociology and psychology. And then I went on and, and uh, was an educator for a number of years. But I decided to stop my, or quit my professional career 26 years ago mm. in order to really study this in depth. I felt it was so compelling that I had to find the answers. And I was interested not only in the abduction phenomenon, but also in the history of government involvement okay. uh, in UFOs, the government studies that had been done, and the decision to cover it up. Okay. Tell us about the books you brought, you know, briefly. Uh, I think you've done, what, three with Stanton Friedman? Stan and I have done three books together. This is Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill okay. UFO Experience. It is uh, information that has never been published anyplace else on Betty's and Barney's lives, the scientific evidence. Okay. Uh, then Stan and I did uh, Science Was Wrong. I didn't bring a copy of that. Okay. Uh, we each wrote half of that book. Um, then Denise Stoner and I did the alien abduction files, mm -hmm. and she is an abductee. I investigated her case, and I did the hypnosis with her. Uh, there are six different cases that I've investigated that I wrote about in okay. this book, and Denise contributed to this book as well. And our most recent book is Fact, Fiction, and Flying Saucers by Stanton and myself just recently released. It's the history of government involvement That's in uh, UFOs, the uh, Air Force's uh, studies, the evidence that UFOs are real, mm -hmm. the decision to cover it up, and the individuals who were involved in the cover-up, the methodology and methods that they used. Hmm. For all interesting stuff. Now, Stanton, you brought one book, but how many books, books have you written? Well, my name is on six, three with Kathy, and then Top Secret Magic, the story of the Majestic 12 thing, which I'll, I talked Tomorrow's about. Tomorrow's lecture. It. Yeah. Uh, one was Crash at Corona. Yep. The, I'm the original civilian investigator of the Roswell incident. Mm -hmm. Civilian investigator, mm -hmm. starting in 1978, not in 47. I was 13 at the time <laughs> there. You know. And uh, Flying Saucers and Science, which is kind of an overview of the whole picture yeah. of ufology and science. And uh, they're all still in print. Uh, they sell well at my lectures and, you know. Uh, I, I see your books everywhere. I was at the Roswell Museum, Stanton Friedman's book. I was at the Atomic Bomb Museum in Vegas, Stanton oh, yes. Friedman's books. <laughs> you know, I see them everywhere I go. Well, 
You know, what I found is I didn't need to be afraid to speak out from worry. I mean, first of all, I was self-employed, so my employer didn't come right. down on me once I, I was, was finished with uh, Westinghouse. But uh, I find there is enormous public interest mm. all over the world, and I can't deny that interest. In other words, I go to Roswell every year, 70th anniversary coming up next year. Mm -hmm. uh, They've had 184,000 visitors last year to the wow. International UFO Museum and Research Center. And Roswell's in the middle of nowhere. It's 200 yeah, miles from Albuquerque, you know, 200 miles from Amarillo, 200 miles from El Paso. But the people come with their families from everywhere. Mm. So the popular misconception is that, oh, nobody believes in UFOs. It's all a bunch of kooky stuff. That simply isn't true. Yeah. Well, the people believe in it. It's just getting the mainstream media and, and the science and the universities to say that they have even an interest in it. Well, that is a problem, and I'm trying to lift the laughter curtain. Mm -hmm. And I think we're making progress. Uh, I think particularly because of the Kepler spacecraft. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people used to think that, well, here we have the only solar system there is. We don't know of any other solar system, no other planets anywhere. Right. It, it's us. We're at the top of the heap. Well, now we know that there are planets all over the place. The Kepler spacecraft says there's between one and 1 1.6 planets per star. Yeah. When you think about that, within a mere 100 light years of here, just down the street, there are 10,000 stars. That mm. means 10,000 planets. That means in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, well over a billion planets. Well, they recently, a couple of weeks ago, tripled the number of galaxies, they believe. They used to say there was 250 to 300 billion galaxies like the Milky Way. They now say there are 1,000 billion galaxies, each with about 200 billion planets. When you multiply that, you get a two with like 25 zeros. I'm interested in the local neighborhood. Don't tell me about <laughs> other saying, galaxies. It's you know? saying how little we know and how there has to be life in space. Uh, statistically, there has to be. Yeah, I, I think we're not the only place that can say God made us and we're special. Right. Uh, a lot out there. <laughs> All right, let's, let's move into this, this highly controversial Majestic 12, because if these documents are real, then this, these are the government documents. I'm sure you talk about it in that book. Yes. Yeah. These are the government documents that, uh, that, that say that it's real. There was a government group working on this. And Fred, interestingly, today's November 18th, right? So what do you think? The date, November 18th, 1952. This is the Eisenhower briefing document on MJ-12. So uh, tell us how you came upon this. And I know you found uh, 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 the Cutler-Twining memo. Tell us a little about, about, about this. And, and if you can, Psalm 21, another one that we've talked about on this show, uh, that is the extraterrestrial entities and technology recovery and disposal. Yeah, th this goes back to, in late 1984, uh, Bill Moore and Jamie Chandra got uh, the Eisenhower briefing document in the mail. Uh, it was on a roll of film. And Bill uh, developed the film. And here's this document claiming that this was a briefing for Ike was elected in the election in November, early November, 1952. Mm -hmm. So this briefing, for him, 18 November, two weeks after the election. And it states that after Roswell, under President Truman, a group called Operation Majestic 12 was established to deal with Roswell and all the implications thereof. I mean, we had wreckage, we had bodies, it says yeah. it very clearly. And, you know, it listed the members of this mysterious MJ-12 group half civilian, half military. And we got some mysterious postcards that suggested we ought to go to Washington. There were some names used in there. Reese's Pieces. Well, the archivist we dealt with at the National Archives was named Ed Reese. Oh, okay. Uh, and there, there were a number of other things. So Bill and Jamie went to Washington, D.C. And while they were there, uh, in box 189, one of the return <laughs> mailing address from one of the postcards they got was box 189, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, or someplace like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and here in box 189, 
at the Air Force intelligence files at the archives, they found the Cutler Twining memo. Bobby Cutler had been a general, was Ike's national security advisor. And it just says NSC MJ-12 Special Studies Briefing. And it's telling General Twining, who went on to be the Air Force Chief of Staff, incidentally, uh, that a briefing that he was supposed to make would take place at a slightly different time. So he's a general, you've got to tell him that you arrange your schedule accordingly kind of thing. And it's a, it's a brief memo, less than half a page. And that mentions NSC, National Security Council, MJ-12 Special Studies Project. Wow, but is it genuine or not? You know, and that's the problem. And if you look, there was one other major problem. If you looked at the list of people on this supposed group that knew everything, there's Dr. Donald Menzel, Harvard University professor of astronomy who'd written three anti-UFO books. He was the big debunker. Big debunker. <laughs> How could he be part of such a crew? But it makes sense that he would be. Well, when you stop to think about it, but I, I found proof of it, that he was qualified, so to speak. I was looking at the papers of Dr. Manabar Bush, who was a Roosevelt science advisor, top dog. Mm -hmm. He was there when the first atom bomb was tested and, and so forth, a really top man. And I found a letter in his papers from an attorney thanking him for all the help he had given and getting Dr. Menzel off on charges of disloyalty and being able to maintain his clearance. Now, wait a minute, what's Menzel doing with, you don't need a security clearance to oh. teach astronomy at Harvard. So I checked and I called the attorney and he said, oh, there's a thousand papers in the file, a thousand pages in the files at Harvard. Menzel was dead, they were all dead, okay. conveniently, you know. So I got permission from three different people to look at his papers. And first thing I look at is a JFK file. What's that doing here, you know? And it turns out, Menzel wrote, they, he and JFK knew each other because he had been on the board of overseers at Harvard, JFK had. Okay. And so, much to my amazement, I look at that file, one of the first things I see is Menzel writing JFK saying, one area I may be able to be of assistance for you after his election in 1960, mind you, was with regard to the Special National Security Agency. I have a longer continuous association with them, 30 years, mm. of anybody in the country. That was a total shock. Uh, when we are properly cleared to each other, I can tell you more. Well, I had one run-in with Menzel. I didn't like the man because he was debunking in totally unscientific ways. Mm. But then to find out, he was also a world-class cryptologist. Nobody knew that. Uh, and so the question was, are any of these documents genuine? Uh, and I would, there, there were a whole bunch out. It was like somebody was turning them out mm. uh, from an Air Force <laughs> OSI or something, class, you know, make up a phony document. So I think there are four genuine ones. That's what I talk about in the book. Oh, okay. So I think there are four genuine ones. And remember, the question isn't, are all the documents genu genuine? Are any is the question. It's like with UFOs, are all the alien spacecraft? Of course not. So what? Mm. Uh, a 300 hitter gets a lot of money for getting a hit 30% of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't say he's a lousy hitter because 70% of the time he didn't get a yeah. hit. So I spent a lot of time digging out that stuff. I also found somebody who worked for President Truman. I asked the Truman Library. I've been to 20 archives. Mm -hmm. I like archives. It's too bad nobody will pay me for spending my time there. But, <laughs> uh, I asked him if anybody was still alive who worked for Truman in the early 50s when this stuff was going down. They gave me the name, uh, George Elsie. Uh, they told me he was alive and in the Washington area. And I called him and said, ask him if I could send him some of these documents and get his comments. I did that. He was very helpful, uh, but I realized at the last minute that uh, if he knows anything, he can't tell me, because it would be highly classified. Mm -hmm. So I didn't ask him whether the document's genuine. Did you see anything about the documents that would lead you to believe they're not genuine? Mm -hmm. He could answer that question. And he told me about the meetings, who was at meetings and, and so forth, and I suggested that that famous Cutler Twining memo, which doesn't have a signature on it, mm -hmm. because Cutler was out of the country, we didn't know that until later. Okay. So then 
He told me that Bobby Cutler and the other guy who was mentioned, the executive secretary of the National Security Agency, uh, was there. Uh, he gave me the insight that they sat next to each other, they each got copies of the other thing, and I said, could this have been written by James Lay? He said, of course. Hmm. Now, he knew these people. He was there in person at the time. So that was a, a big step up, because I believe the rules should be have facts in hand before putting mouth in gear, or computer in gear, as the case may be. So there's another thing that goes with this. There's a lot of research in here, but we got a copy of the memo that resulted in the closure of Project Blue Book. This is a memo from an Air Force general, Carol Bolander. He didn't have yeah. anything to do with, Bolin with uh, Blue Book. October 69, right? Was yes. the Bolander memo. He was asked to, what should we do about Project Blue Book? Because the University of Colorado people, the Condon Report said we should close Project Blue Book. Mm -hmm. He wrote a memo, which we didn't see until 10 years later. I think it got accidentally released with a oh, pile of okay. other stuff that went to Bob uh, Todd. Uh, in which he said, quote, reports of UFOs which could affect national security are made in accordance with Joint Arm Army, Navy, Air Force Publication 146 or Air Force Manual 55-11 and are not part of Project Blue Book. There you go. What? That was a total shocker. So the and ones that affected national security were not you, part of Blue Book. Yeah. The best and, cases. Yeah, and, and <laughs> two paragraphs later he says, <laughs> if, if we close Project Blue Book, the public won't have a place to report a UFO sighting. However, as previously noted, reports which could affect national security will continue to be investigated using the procedures designed for that purpose. I called Bolander and talked to him and said, it sounds like you're saying there are two different communication channels here. And I said, one for reports which could affect national security. And I had just heard about a case where a saucer went down the runway at a strategic air command base where nuclear weapons were stored. Mm -hmm. If that isn't a national security consideration, I don't know what it is. And the other, if my wife and I are driving and see a UFO, big deal, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. He agreed with me, two separate communication channels. Because it then answers, this answers the question, so where did the good stuff go? Yeah, absolutely. And, I think Majestic 12, whose name has undoubtedly been changed since we've been talking about it, hmm. uh, fills the bill. And if there's anybody out there who knows anything, look me up, send me some comments, I'm on the internet. The crit criticisms of this that came out was that the November 18th, 52 date was prior to Eisenhower taking office in January of 53. But I'll point out, yesterday's news, they're briefing Trump on everything he needs to know. Today is November 18th. That's November 18th. They absolutely briefed the incoming president two months prior. I was able to prove that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I checked with the other people who would have been there, various, the... Uh, desk calendars, if you will, of various and other members of the National Security Establishment. And that he was present. And he was, he came into Washington, he saw President Truman early in the day, and he was briefed at the Pentagon on that day. Okay. Uh, I can prove that, that's easy to prove. So, uh, yes, I, I don't know what Trump was hearing about anything. Remember, Ike had been in charge of uh, our forces in Europe. Mm -hmm. So he already had a long history of security right, clearances. Right. So you don't have to worry about, can we clear him? Right, yeah, he's I think already we can, been cleared. You know. but, but Fred, about three or four times on this show, I've received something in the mail anonymously. Right. We've talked about right. these things. And I was showing this to Stanton prior to, and I'll make you a copy. Uh, I got this one, and this is a couple of years ago. Uh, it has to do with the, for the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. It's dated November 5th of 61, so under the, the Kennedy administration, and it has top secret umbra on it. I think it said MJ-12 on here. There it is, MJ-12 yes. operations, U.S. intelligence. And, you know, and it, it goes into the MJ-12 and early warning and can they, the Russians misidentify a, uh, um, a UFO a, as a missile. So Stanton had said he hadn't seen this. No. There so are a number of uh, phony documents, copy? Yeah. but I'd love to have a, this one looks much better than most of the phony we're ones. We're going to make a copy of that and we're going to give it to you. And you can write an article for the MUFON Journal I on, have a monthly on your, column. your research. And anybody <laughs> listening who wants to contribute because the cat's out of the bag now. That's it. Yeah. Tell me more. All right. Let's
let's move on to, uh, we're going to just bounce back and forth is the, the way we're going to do this now. Tell us about the Benny and Barney Hill. What was significant about it? Uh, you know, UFOs had been in the public eye since, they like to say Roswell in 47. I keep going back to the Battle of L.A. in 42 because I think that was as significant. But so for, for 20 years, 15 years, UFOs have been, what was so important about the Betty and Barney Hill case? Betty and Barney Hill case was the first case that was investigated by scientists who believed that the case was credible, that it probably did happen. Uh, Betty and Barney were highly credible individuals. She was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. He worked for the post office. He had served honorably in the army during World War II. He had uh, an excellent character reference when he was released. Mm -hmm. uh, he, in 1965, was appointed to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission's State Advisory Committee. Uh, he received an award from Sergeant Shriver for the uh, work he did for the Office of Economic Opportunity. Both were credible people, well known in the state of New Hampshire, reliable individuals. That makes a difference, the, mm -hmm. the credibility of the individual. They also had conscious, continuous recall of observing a uh, silent, hovering disc at close range. Um, Barney had gotten out of the car and had conscious continuous recall of observing figures on board that craft who were dressed in shine, shiny black uniforms that he described immediately as being somehow not human. That's a quote. Uh, so there was this conscious recall. They weren't lying in bed at night and asleep and believing they had this experience. There was a lot of evidence that it happened, not okay. only eyewitness testimony by them, but also physical evidence when they arrived home. Betty's dress was torn in several locations. Later, she found a pink powdery, powdery substance that had grown on it. Betty, Barney's best dress shoes were so deeply scraped he had to purchase new shoes. The clocks, the watches they were wearing that night had worked fine. On the evening of the encounter, they never ran again. Wow. There were shiny spots on the trunk of the car that caused a trunk compass needle to spin and spin, indicating a counter-rotating magnetic field. We've seen this in other cases. There was a lot of evidence to back up their story. Okay. And the special character of Dr. Benjamin Simon, the psychiatrist who did the hypnosis work, okay. he operated a hospital with 3,000 beds for people who'd had what we would today call post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Shell shock war veterans, mm -hmm. it was the expression back then. He said that the intensity of their emotion as they relived, he taped all his hypnosis sessions, was every bit as strong as that of the war veterans that he had worked with. Mm -hmm. Coming from him, Yeah. that's meaningful. Yeah, I, no, I agree with that. Now, um, Betty described the long needle. Did a amniocentesis exist back no. then? Amniocentesis was being developed she would not have had access to yeah. that information. And, uh, you know, so it was not being used in hospitals at that time. But yet time. she described it and it was performed on her, I assume. Yes. yes. Yeah, before it was even in, in use. Interesting. <laughs> that's, that's, my that wife had it, yeah. had it done when she was pregnant. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that, that's unbelievable. So, uh, so what else about the case? Uh, there was something about a star system. Correct? That, what's the story on the <laughs> yes, star system? Yes, and, and uh, when Betty was on the craft, and th this was revealed through hypnosis, mm -hmm. uh, she uh, had finished, they had finished with her physical examination, and she was more comfortable now. She was left alone with the individual she called the leader okay. while the examiner went to the room that Barney was in. And she said to him, I know you're not from around here. Obviously. Where are you from? <laughs> And he produced this sort of three-dimensional star map. Uh, there were stars the size of pinpoints, and there were also stars as large as nickels. And Dr. Simon gave her the post-hypnotic suggestion that she would be able to draw that if it didn't bother her too much and if she could remember it accurately. Mm -hmm. And she went home and she did this as a result of that post-hypnotic suggestion. It appeared in the first book that was ever written about their case after there was a violation of confidentiality in 1965 and it went to the public. They permitted John G. Fuller to write the book, The Interrupted Journey. Mm -hmm. And it appeared in that book, a brilliant woman from Ohio, Marjorie Fish, 
uh, did research on that star map. She constructed 23 models of our local galactic neighborhood. 3D. 3D, yes. okay. Using monofilament line and colored beads diff of different sizes. And she had to go to the university. She had to sit at the university and copy the information on the distance data and the other characteristics of those stars. She had to take that data home and do the math to know where to place each of those stars in this three-dimensional frame. Uh, and what did it match up with? And uh, I want Stan to tell that story because Stan <laughs> is the individual and that's why I asked him to join me in writing Captured because he is the expert on the star map. He was the scientist who was asked by Coral Lorenzen from APRO yeah. to interview Marjorie Fish to see if she was credible and if she was to find scientists who would vet her work for accuracy. Okay, so tell us. <laughs> Okay, when, when she asked the alien where he was from, or whatever the alien is, did he talk back to her? I yes. Mean, what, what was his he didn't say where uh, he was from. He only showed the star map, and he said, uh, do you know where you are? on this map. He, and, he spoke English. Was it uh, telepathic? It was telepathic okay. communication. Okay. Okay. That's what I um, yes, it was telepathic. Okay. Dr. Simon asked if they saw a movement of the mouth, yeah. and both Betty and Barney, under hypnosis, separately stated that they did not see the mouth move okay. during communication. So that's and how that happened. What did the alien look like? It, uh, was not exactly like a gray alien we think of today. The skin color was gray. They, it, they had heads that were larger in proportion to their bodies than humans. Uh, they had spindly limbs. They had barrel-shaped chests. They had a slit for a mouth. Betty and Barney thought that they saw some kind of membrane that moved inside their mouths. They only had holes where our ears would be. They thought that there were holes there. They had noses that were uh, very, very tiny, almost flat, and eyes that were very large and kind of wrapped around to the sides of their heads. But they saw a dark pupil, a dark iris, and they also saw this yellowish color around the outside. So it wasn't like those large, glistening black eyes that we think of with uh, the grays that we think of as the stereotypic grays today. There actually are many different types of grays that are described <laughs> right, by experience. Not all earthlings look alike. Right, right, right. right. That's what I was asking. I mean, some of us have beards, uh, some of us only have... <laughs> some of us know. have hair. <laughs> <laughs> but and, let, before you move on to... Let me, let me ask this. There, there was a criticism of this that that alien was featured in a uh, Outer Limits episode, but didn't that episode air Afterwards, that was the episode later. aired for the first time in February of 1964 when Barney was undergoing hypnosis. Now, Barney was still working nights mm -hmm. at the post office. Betty and Barney both stated that they never watched that show. Okay. And uh, other researchers besides myself have investigated that as well. Mm -hmm. And we're all satisfied that they never saw that. I've even done a study of the characteristics of this Bifrost man as opposed to the written descriptions that Betty and Barney left of what these individuals looked like. It's not the same. Okay, why do you call it a Bifrost man? I thought that was a Viking Norwegian uh, thing. <laughs> well, that was the name. It was That's the, what they called? It was uh, on the Outer Limits. Oh, what that was, was in the episode. And, oh, okay. and the man was called the Bifrost Oh, I didn't man. know that. Okay, I was yes. wondering, because that's a, that's a Viking term. Isn't that uh, interesting? Yeah, the Bifrost. Yeah. Yes. Let's, let's clear up one other thing here, the, the, uh, the question we asked you prior. We've had a few people ask us, is it possible that Barney and Betty could actually be Barack Obama's dad? <laughs> 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 seeing, that, seeing that their abduction was the same year that he was born, only a few months. Before. It was like 11 months yeah, instead of 9 or, well, he was or born 7 on months. on yeah. August 4th, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. I know that because that's my birthday as well. And, uh, well, you could only believe that if uh, Barack Obama's birth certificate is inaccurate, I suppose. Well, that's, <laughs> you would uh, think that's that still up for question. he could possibly be a hybrid. <laughs> yeah. but, but see, again, there's really no history 
for Barack Obama. Yeah. Well, he has produced. He well, has produced that. As the government, as Stan said, the government can't believe a word they say. <laughs> <laughs> Did I well, say that? <laughs> I, and it shows his biological mother in, in the films of him. I have seen photographs of his biological father. They were not Betty and Barney Hill. So it, Although people say there is a physical resemblance. There, there oh, is. There's a very good absolutely. physical resemblance. Uh, they were but, by feet. <laughs> yeah, they walked on two feet, too. Well, but, it would uh, be interesting if my cousin was actually president of the United States, yeah. but I can't take credit <laughs> but for since that. he's got two <laughs> months left in his term and he has dissed the whole UFO field because he doesn't believe there's any life in no. space I'd have to say we could probably write that one off he didn't do anything <laughs> with it <laughs> so as far as the help well, we got that cleared up then. to help this field yeah okay. but we've had that question asked a couple of times yeah. one, one of the interesting things about the star map is it gives us a, a different sense about our local neighborhood the base stars in this map two stars that were nickel size and close to each other turn out to be Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli. That's the constellation of reticulum. You can't see it from here. Right. Mm -hmm. I would love to give a lecture and say, let's go outside and look at them, but <laughs> I can't. You gotta go down, I've been to Australia, but still. And what's special there is those two stars are only 39.3 light years from here. I mean, the galaxy is 100,000 light years across, so mm -hmm. that's next door, practically speak. But those two stars from each other are only an eighth of a light year apart. The 35 times closer to each other than the sun is to the next star over. We're out in the boonies. Right. These guys had next door neighbors. It would seem very logical to me that the closer you have a neighbor, the more likely you are to develop interstellar travel. You want to know what's going on up there? You could determine a lot just by looking mm -hmm. because the other star is visible all day long. Kind of a neat trick. We don't have any besides right. the sun that right. are visible all day long. So that work is, is very exciting to me anyway. I was the first to publish an article about that work. And so I'm convinced that that's meaningful, sensible stuff. Marjorie was a very bright gal, member of Mensa, incidentally. Okay. Uh, and so th that gives us, you know, it's nice to know that we're talking about a, a close, a nearby system, as opposed to thousands of light years away. You hear people saying, oh, aliens would have to come from other galaxies. Mm -hmm. you know, the next galaxy, two million light years away. There's 10,000 stars within 100 light years of here, and the latest work suggests there's a, at least one planet around each of them. So it, it gives you a whole new direction about what are we talking about here? Mm. I know some people say, well, gee, they'd have to come from thousands of light years. No, they could come from down the street. And that changes our perception of where we fit in the scheme of things. Okay, you take, you take back, back before Christ was born and everything else. Okay, some of the structures that were made back then. I mean, allegedly we used chicken bones to make them because we didn't have the tools in that. So if somebody had to make them. Okay, and it, it wasn't us, all right? Do you think it's possible that whatever made them is still here today? Which I would have to say they were aliens, I mean, you know. I, I can't say it wasn't possible. I, we, there's so much we don't know. You know, people think we know everything there is to right, know, right. and you know, it's, everything is finished, uh, so forth. Quite the reverse. There were people who thought the world is only 6,000 years old. Right. That's a lot mm. different from right. 4 billion years right. old. Uh, and so the star map is just another part of the picture, but it does force us to re-examine our assumptions about where could they come from? You know, is there anybody out there? Right. Could there possibly be anybody out there? Some people say there might be, well, Frank Drake said he, said he stands for silly effort to investigate. Yeah. You know that now, <laughs> not search for extraterrestrial intelligence. A few years ago, he said there might be as many as 8,000 places in a galaxy that could send us signals. Today, thanks to the Kepler Space Telescope, you might say there are oh, several billion right. stars that could have planets that could be sending us signals. So it changes our perspective. Uh, it doesn't make us the big shots we'd like to think we are, but I'm sorry, that's the way life is. Now that, that star system, is that the same one that the Dogen tribe of Mali No, that's identified? around Sirius. Oh, okay, I thought it was Zeta. Okay, is that the twin star system? Well, with the dwarf, I thought that was Zeta. The, but they knew about it. The point is they knew about it 100 years ago when we didn't even have the telescopes. <laughs> well, we had telescopes, but we, we've gotten a lot smarter thanks to Kepler, among yeah. other things. We have such exquisite sensitivity in these new devices from mm -hmm. taking pictures from outer space. You don't have to shoot through the atmosphere, in right. other words. And uh, so Marjorie's work, uh, I was very pleased to meet her, to encourage her, to publish about her work. Brilliant woman and most, one of the most objective people I've ever met. Yeah. You mentioned Frank Drake. Uh, is Project Ozma, was that true that he, they had gotten signals 
from the south, the SETI, well, uh, and, and then they went undercover with Arecibo and made it a government project once they did I, get signals? I don't think so. There, okay. Look, there are plenty of signals coming in, partly from spy satellites. You pick up a signal. But not back then, mm. yeah. Well, there have been satellites yeah. up for a long time, but, uh, and other natural things. But we're just, we haven't broken out of our, our shell right. about knowing mm. what's going on, except that. We know that there are planets all over the place. This is a very big step. And we know that there are many systems where you have more than uh, one star close to another star. You know, you don't, it's not all long distance travel. It's next door kind yeah. of thing. So it, it's very exciting work and it certainly stimulated me and a lot of other people. Uh, I was the one who induced, uh, suggested that the editor of Astronomy Magazine do an article about Marjorie's work. Mm. And they got more response to that than anything else they published, mm. uh, which surprised them a bit, to tell you the truth. And then Carl Sagan's name was on the outside of the uh, booklet that they put together about those original articles. His lawyer threatened to sue them, so they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I wound up with 15,000 copies of this booklet about Zeta Reticuli yeah. in my garage. They're all gone. I wish I had them. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sagan was, uh, you know, you credit him a lot with uh, space, but he was not a believer in the UFOs or life in space, or at least not close was, enough to a, get here. He was a believer that there was probably life out Somewhere, there. Somewhere, yeah. Carl and I were in the same classes at the University of Chicago for yeah. three years. We're the same mm -hmm. age. We grew up in adjacent towns in New Jersey. And you're still alive. <laughs> and, and, I'm, I'm, so there, that counts. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I, I give Carl credit for doing more than anybody else to get people to think about life in outer space. Right. He didn't do his homework on UFOs. For example, to, just to give you one example, he said there are interesting sightings that aren't reliable. That's true. There are some reliable sightings that aren't interesting. That's also true. But then he said there are no interesting and reliable sightings, which is totally false. Mm -hmm. It gives no reference. Right. Blue Book Special Report 14 proves that that simply isn't true. So mm -hmm. he got away with that. In two different books, he made that same comment. Hmm. He hadn't done his homework. Yeah. That's All true right. of debunkers in general, I would say. Let me ask you a question, since you were a family member and an insider. How, how was the reaction back then to them being an interracial couple, hitting the news, and it hit the news by accident, right? They kind of confided in somebody who then threw it out there. Yes. How did that play into it? You know, I mean, it's accepted nowadays, but back then, maybe not so much. Betty and Barney initially thought that they were going to lose their jobs when this happened. We had a family meeting to, mm -hmm. to decide what to, to do about this. They were extremely upset because they were very active working in the civil rights movement together. They did not want to be known as these kooky people who had had an alien abduction. Yeah. And uh, those who knew them knew how credible they were. But there were individuals who I believe were disinformants who cast a shadow of doubt in the minds of the American public, distorted the information, and even suggested that they were taken because he was African American and she was white. I, I really don't believe that was the case. His skin was a little bit darker than hers. His black hair was a little curlier than hers. Mm. She had black curly hair as well. Mm -hmm. She was just a little bit lighter than him. He was a man, she was a woman. I think they'd be more interested in picking up one of each of the sexes. Yeah, how, how did it actually get let out because I thought the interviews were in confidence. How did that part where it hit, it totally surprised them, <coughs> it hit the press, right? It did. Uh, and what happened was a, a woman named Laurie D'Alessandro uh, had, uh, was a member of a UFO group. She befriended Betty. Betty shared information with her. She told her about uh, what Betty and Barney had recalled under hypnosis separately in the hypnosis sessions with uh, Dr. Benjamin Simon. And, but this was confidential. And Laurie spoke to John Luttrell, who was a reporter for the Boston Traveler. <coughs> in September of 1965, John Luttrell wrote a letter to <coughs> Betty and Barney saying, I have been talking with your friend Laurie D'Alessandro, and I would like to speak with you as well. Uh, and he did speak over the telephone with one of them. I have that evidence. But he wanted to meet with them, and they did not want to meet with him. Uh, he reassured them in writing that if they would speak with him, that he would never publicize it. 
and uh, never do it for a profit in any way. Of course, that was a lie. They did not speak with him. They spoke to many other people, to the Air Force. I have a letter that he wrote to Stanton Friedman, um, and he stated that he had interviewed somewhere between 12 and 14 witnesses to this UFO on the same night that Betty and Barney oh, had their okay, experience. So corroborated, yeah. And uh, so many people spoke to him. Betty and Barney did not. And then he wrote a series in the Boston Traveler, five nightly issues. Wow. Well, you talk about being thrown under the bus. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Very much so. yeah. <laughs> right. Let's segue into Roswell, then we'll talk about the MUFON uh, abduction uh, group. Uh, so you're, I think it was 78. Uh, it's yeah. 21 years after Roswell. The story disappeared. They debunked it within a couple of days of being Project Mogul. And uh, so how do you all of a sudden get involved with Roswell and reopen that case? Well, totally by accident. <laughs> And <laughs> being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or synchronicity say. of being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. <laughs> I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana to do a lecture at Louisiana State University, which is there. And I was taken to the big television station in town and was supposed to do three interviews. I did the first two, and the third reporter was nowhere to be found. Nobody had cell phones back then. This is 78. And so the station manager is giving me coffee. He's looking at his watch. He knew the people who brought me to campus. He knew I had other things to do. And out of the blue, he says, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. Brilliant investigator that I am. I said, who's he? <laughs> <laughs> His next sentence changed my life. He handled wreckage of one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. What? Where did that come from? You know, completely out of, what do you know about him? He lives in Homa. I didn't know where Homa was. <laughs> it's a city in, uh, in Louisiana, and I was there later on to talk to Jesse. Uh, He's a great guy, we're old ham radio buddies, you ought to talk to him. And then the reporter showed up. Okay, it was busy that night, the lecture went extremely well. The next day from the airport, I decided I ought to use an old fashioned technique by today's standards. I called information. Was there a listing for Jesse Marcel in Homa, wherever it was? <laughs> yeah. And there was, and I called him, and he talked to me. And I didn't find out until later that his name and picture were in newspapers around the world in 47. Mm. I didn't know about that until later. And he told me his story, and I was very impressed because he was straightforward and because he was the intelligence officer for the 509th, which was the only atomic bombing group in the entire world. They dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, two more in Operation Crossroads and stuff. You don't get to be the intelligence officer for that group without being very special, for having a lot on the ball. I've talked to pilots that were briefed by Jesse when he was intelligence officer, mm -hmm. and they were very impressed by the briefings. Mm -hmm. So uh, I followed up on that. I shared the information with Bill Moore. We started uh, looking to try to figure out when this happened, where it happened, and so forth. We had an article <laughs> in Britain about a guy who heard about a crashed saucer in Roswell. And he could pin down the date. He was driving from Los Angeles to Philadelphia. And a trip you would remember back then. The roads weren't very mm. great, as you might expect. And so we pinned down the date. We made a real effort. I got lucky. I called, I, I looked at editor and publisher, found that, hey, there's a newspaper in Roswell. What do I know? Uh, the Roswell Daily Record. I called the Roswell Daily Record. I said, I'd like to talk to the editor from 47. This is in 78. Uh, long gone, what do you need? Well, I've got this article that says, a guy named Walter Hout or Hot, uh, base public information officer, put out a story. Just, his wife works here. What? <laughs> Total surprise, you know. So I talked to the wife, talked to Walter. He was a, a World War II bombardier, too, incidentally, and dropped the instrument package on one of the ato atomic bomb tests at an Operation Crossroads. You pick your best guy to do that, yep. incidentally. We found, within the next year or so, we found over 60 people connected with the base. Walter had a base yearbook, and I got a copy of it and stuff. And we, by, uh, a few years later, it was up to 90 soon. So you start checking around, and I heard other stories. I was at a lecture in uh, Minnesota, uh, and people came up to me afterward. They knew about crash in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So it's been a persistent, ongoing set of research. A lot of other people involved. I'm a member of the Roswell UFO Hall of Fame. <laughs> so 
Roswell has been, uh, I've been there for almost all these celebrations. Uh, I had a heart attack one year, so I didn't go, but mm -hmm. uh, otherwise. Uh, and people in Roswell have been great about this subject. The museum, as I said, has had visitors. 184,000 visitors to this little town of under 50,000 people. I went one for year. the first time in 2013. There, you saw a lot of people there, didn't you? Well, I went actually the week before because I didn't want to hit the crowd. <laughs> I wanted to actually look in the library and do my thing before the crowd hit. Well, it's a popular place. People come from all over the world. And uh, I've had people say, oh, base commander uh, was a, a loose cannon, Colonel Blanchard. Well, it turns out he got four more promotions and he was a four-star general and vice chief of staff of the United States Air Force when he died of a massive heart attack at the Pentagon. So he got promoted after saying it was a UFO. <laughs> yeah, four, four, didn't get four more promotions. Yeah, didn't get no. discipline, no. And uh, so he was, he was an outstanding guy. And the whole story, again, it's the character and jobs of the people. Remember, this is 47. Mm -hmm. The war was only over a couple of years, you know? Yeah. And they all had high-level security clearances. Roswell, I mean, admittedly, uh, Lyndon Johnson did them dirt. They moved the base because they didn't vote for Lyndon in the 64 wow. election. Would you believe that? <laughs> you would believe that, I think. Yeah. So it's, it's a fascinating case and lots of people involved. And they're just about all gone now, yeah. as, as you can imagine. But uh, so I've been the champion of Roswell, if you will. But uh, it is an example of if you get enough people to speak out, you can make progress. Absolutely. Well, we're out of time. <laughs> we ran out of time. So uh, maybe you could stay and do another episode when we can talk about the abduction side of this. So I want to thank you both for being here. And that's our show for this week, Fred. Well, Fred, we want to continue this since we got these two great guests here. And, uh, you know, we didn't get time to talk about MUFON's abduction team, uh, experience your research team. So let, let's continue now into the MUFON side of this. Um, at one point, you were our director of investigations, right, years ago? I was the director of field investigator training oh, for 10 okay. years. Okay. And um, then in 2011, I was appointed director of abduction research. And so what my role was initially was to set up protocols and procedures for doing abduction investigations. MUFON had never done that, and uh, they were sort of ignored. And so I worked with a team of individuals, uh, law enforcement officers, who helped me to write protocols for, for a forensic investigation with scientists, a variety of different individuals on a team. And we did that, so that that is added to our uh, in investigation studies now. Uh, along with how to investigate a UFO. Okay. And so that's how I got started. Then it was, well, what is next? What do we do? What goals do we establish? We wanted to have a research uh, end. And we have Dr. Don C. Don Derry, who is a retired psychology professor from McGill University. And he helps us out on our research projects. We are currently doing a 118 question experiencer survey to identify commonalities and characteristics among individuals who believe that they have had abduction experiences. So we have that going. Uh, we also have a team now of 12 individuals who uh, assist field investigators when they ask for assistance. They are the people who are the experts in ab abductions and in these types of experiences uh, so that we will help out as uh, advisors on field investigations. Certainly we don't have the funding to go there to, to do boots on the ground, but we offer opinions, we offer assistance and we'll actually write a separate report. We'll, we'll speak with the individuals via Skype or over the telephone. And we also have a section where our team speaks to individuals who want to speak in complete confidentiality. They don't want an investigation. For many people who have had these experiences, an investigation is very anxiety producing. Yeah. And uh, they don't want to risk having their identity known. Uh, oftentimes they have maybe told a family member or a good friend and they've been ridiculed. 
and they've never been able to work through the trauma they might be experiencing or the questions that they have about this. So we will talk to individuals in a non-judgmental manner if they uh, are looking for uh, an, uh, a referral to someone outside, a professional or a, a support person then we can make referrals to that. We have a short list. Okay. Now you've got a number of Pennsylvania people that work with Fred and I in our group that actually help you, right? You uh, have uh, yeah, George Doc Medich, who's been on the show. Who twice. is actually the assistant director and yeah. uh, really is taking a, almost a lead role on this team. He is in charge of all of the questionnaires that people take on the MUFON's website. It's the Experiencer Questionnaire. It's 30 questions. and. When people complete that, then the information goes to Dr. Medich, mm -hmm. and he makes assignments so that members of the team will contact the individuals who completed the questionnaires. Okay, you also have Mike Melton, who is uh, part of our Philadelphia team. He, he's with your group, Yes, right? and Michael Melton has a doctorate in clinical psychology and worked for many years with uh, veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder and also in general clinical psychology. He's retired, but he he is a very valuable member of our team as well. Okay. Did, now, did uh, Glenn Bailey uh, up in Erie and Robert Bahanna in Uniontown, are they part of your group too, or maybe they're a not, lesser role? They're not part of the group, but they are part of the referral, referral. system. Okay. So if people are looking for a psychologist who knows something, who believes that this is credible and is not going to, to they will not simply write them off, then um, we have them on our referral list. We have two new individuals from Erie, too, who are going to be helping out uh, Kathy. Oh, the Lanes. And, uh, yeah. Yes. Kathy, Kathy and Fred, and Fred Lane, Lane had asked to. Who are brand new members who say that they have plenty of time and are very interested in this and are willing to work as a team in speaking with individuals who complete the questionnaires. Okay. So, so I mean, we're pretty proud of that, that there's six people mm. out of 38 investigators here in yes, Pennsylvania. Yes, more people than any other state. Yeah. yeah we, and we even have a guy that's in, uh, he has an office in Monroeville. He'll do this stuff for us. Uh, remember the Uniontown right, case right, right. in, in the J.C. Penney's? Yeah, yeah. He sat, yeah, he sat down now. and interviewed her, and he gave us a 12-page report that he believed that would was factual. Yeah. She saw mm -hmm. a little gray in the J.C. Penney's, mm -hmm. you know, and it wasn't progeria. We checked; there was mm -hmm. no cases of that in this area. Uh, says, and then had, had a sports coat on, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> in J.C. Penney's. But, uh, but he'll be at the, he'll probably be at the conference tomorrow. He comes every year. Yeah, so but Robert Bahana yeah. will be there. Yeah. I don't think Glenn will make it tomorrow, but mm -hmm. Doc Medich will, will will be there uh, also. Okay, Fred, any questions uh, with the abductions? You've, you've had questions about how do we handle the uh, cases, at what point did they get involved, what do you do with the information, right? Did, yeah, I, just, we'll I, did I just ask the okay, questions okay, for you? Explain the process. <laughs> okay, we get a case, all right, we investigate it. And uh, it, it's an abduction case, okay, mm -hmm. so the person was abducted. Um, what do we do with it? I mean, we, we do the investigation and we give it to you your people okay That's then right. do we close the case out well it depends upon how you want to handle it and you oh. would have to talk to your state director <coughs> about that but if you it's would me. like assistance it's me <laughs> and you are the state director there yes yeah, so uh, if you would like assistance right. uh, to determine whether or not this uh, scenario meets the characteristics Right. of a real abduction. We have information that we don't disseminate to the public right. because if, if we did, then we wouldn't be able to determine whether or not uh, it was consistent with a real abduction. So we have that information. We can work with the field investigator. Uh, sometimes uh, we go on as the second investigator mm -hmm. and do an investigation and write our own report. Uh, so there are a variety of ways. Uh, if you want us on another end of it, then we could only speak to the experiencer and write an ERT report, which would be an addendum to the report uh, that you would uh, file mm. on MUFON's case management system. Or if you didn't want us for any of those things, and we mm. hope that you would ask for our assistance, but if you didn't want to, if you could handle it entirely yourself, mm. then uh, you could refer that individual to us if they wanted hypnosis 
or if they needed a support group, if they had been traumatized by this event, or there were things that they couldn't remember, but they had conscious continuous recall as well. Okay, so you said the E or what is that now? It's the experiencer research team. Yeah, but you said you'd write a report that put it as an addendum in ours. What, yes, what we would we? write an ERT, experiencer research team. Mm -hmm. We changed the name a couple of years ago from abduction research team uh -huh. to experiencer research team because we received a lot of mail, a lot of hate mail, saying that uh, come up to the modern times. You're behind. It's not just all abductions. It's not all traumatic. So well, the hear, decision was made in MUFON to change it to experiencer. So I, I that's hear, where that came I from. hear a lot of abductees. They say in the beginning they're abducted, then they become experiencers or contactees. So you know, they, you Yes, know, they, you know, and, and I do find that, that over time they become more comfortable right, with, right, with right. what is going on. Yeah. They remember more initially when they don't have a memory of what has happened while they were on the craft. Then uh, they might be traumatized about what might have happened. They might have read some really horrible things mm -hmm. or heard horrible things. They, and when they finally do recall what happened, it's not nearly as bad as what they anticipated. I, is that, I thought, is that I a thought. Stockholm syndrome where yeah. they can't stop it or do anything about it so they accept it? You know, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, some people believe that uh, it is Stockholm Syndrome. What happens for, to most individuals is when they're on the craft, they're reassured that they will not be harmed. Uh, they are told that they, they might be told that they are loved. They might be set, told that they are part of the family. Uh, and is that deception? Or is that real? It depends upon one's perspective. Mm -hmm. But it, it is very comforting to the people who are having these experiences. I, I do know that. I, I recently, you know, I get around, mm -hmm. okay? I by talk, car, not by, <laughs> not with your head. I, uh, I've talked to a few people. As a matter of fact, I talked to a lady last year um, who was camping, and a light came over, and she got all, you know, and we started talking. I said I was with MUFON and that. And she said that she was abducted about, 10 years ago, and now they're abducting her granddaughter. Mm -hmm. So she actually accompanies her granddaughter on the abductions, which I, I've really never heard of that until this lady told me that. I mean, does that happen? We have found in our research that uh, it does tend to be generational. Right, right, So yeah. if uh, they take, for example, a mother, then they would take her daughter and right. the granddaughter, or the, son, the men too. I mean, it's not limited to women. We've ran into that situation. <laughs> we actually had a shotgun pulled on us one time. <laughs> but but I'm saying what I'm saying is I mean the, okay like a lot of them say that they go up and uh, they're in the, in a craft and they see somebody looks like their grandmother, or grandfather, or aunt or uncle or cousin, and tell them to go ahead and do it. They're not going to harm you. But but again, do you think these these aliens or whatever they are, let's just say entities, are are they? Um, What's the word? Uh, Friendly? Good, good or bad? Good or bad? Malevolent or benevolent? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, See, I'm from West Virginia. I don't know them words. That is another question that we have posed. Uh. And uh, we find that less than 10 percent, about 9 percent, right. believe that they are evil. About uh, 3 percent say that they've had very bad experiences. Right. Uh, about half, or a little more than half, have stated that they seem businesslike. Um, and they, the experiences have been both positive and negative. When you ask experiencers if they could end it, if, mm. they, would, if they could, then mm. the majority will say no. Right. But you see, that's the main difference between a near-death experience mm. and an alien abduction or demonic possession. Once it starts in those two, you can't stop it. You have no control. Yeah. A near-death experience, almost every time you're given a choice to right. stay, or you can go back to yeah. your life. And it's, it's not that, see, I view it as yeah. this, this hostile takeover, you know, and I, I'll move your number from 9% to 10% as malevolent because that's where my vote is. See, yeah. but what I don't understand again, okay, so now we have, uh, allegedly I was abducted when I was uh, three years old, three or four years old, okay? Now look, that's I, told to you by relatives, yeah, right? Yeah, I was, my relatives never told me this. So it was a neighbor that told me, and she said that her brother could back it up and her brother actually did back it up, all right? Now, I mean, today I, I wake up every now and then with some weird marks on me and a thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. But what I don't understand now, so these things have been coming, we know, since 1947, 
Okay? Haven't they found out what they want to find out? I mean, you know, see, this is what I don't understand. If they're doing, if they're taking these people up, why, what is it that they're continuing to Why not clone the DNA from us well, for? Yeah. You know, I we mean, live a very long lifetime. We're not like rats. So if they're doing a longitudinal genetic study right. or a sociological study, right. if they're uh, examining us across generations, then it's going to take a very long time to do that. Mm -hmm. And if they are manipulating our genetic makeup, then it would take a very long time to do that as well. Okay. Uh, and that's the only way that I can explain it. Another question. So now. that's more of a sociological study, yeah. or is it still a DNA study? I think that it's probably both. Both? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. A lot of people, I have spoke to, I'd say maybe three or four people now. I've been doing this since the 90s, and I've actually started investigating UFOs back in the 70s mm -hmm. when I was a police chief. But they're saying now that they are coming to take their soul. You ever heard that? I have been reading a little bit about that, and what I am reading, for example, in Susie Hansen's book, and Susie Hansen is what many people believe is a credible woman from New Zealand. Okay. She had the typical alien abduction initially, oh. but as time went on, she came to believe, and that most of this was the result of hypnosis, although she does have some conscious continuous recall, that uh, before she was born, uh, they had gone to her and asked if uh, they could take her soul and they could insert themselves into this human body. And so many people who think this is happening also say that this is happening to their children. Mm. Susie stated when she was a youngster, she would go onto a, uh, an alien craft and that there would be this blue ball of light and that the children on that craft would move that blue ball of light uh, not using their hands at all, just mm. psychically. And uh, that she found out that that ball of light was actually her son. And right. then many years later she had this son. It sounds really uh, far out. No, well, it isn't, uh, it, it isn't, when you, you but, really get into this. But when you get into it, yeah. I mean to the, the general you, public, but when you get into it, you hear that many people feel that they have made that decision before they were born, born. and that that's, that's the ETs would, are only visiting uh, their own family, uh, and that's the reason the ETs say you are okay. part of our family. Okay, that, that is the other question I was asked you, before you're born. All right, now, we get into that. They, allegedly, I've heard that before we're born, we're told exactly what's going to happen to us our whole lifetime. You choose and your we, parents and, and the we type gotta, of yeah, life. Yeah, we got to agree to it or disagree with it. And anything that happens to us, we agree with. Now, how, how could the aliens or ETs or whatever they are talk to these people? I mean, I, I, see, this is what blows my mind. Telepathy. But, but they ain't born yet. I mean, if you're not born yet. Well, they're communicating with the soul then. Yeah, but I mean, so... And who would be communicating with a soul? You have well, to ask that yeah, question. You should I mean, be yeah, a highly that's what's religious, spiritual I mean, how, yeah. how yeah. can they do this? Yeah. But I mean, you know, that same... We don't have answers to all the questions, yeah. gentlemen Absolutely. and ladies. I mean, that, that's the kicker here. People think we know all there is to know, and if we don't have an answer, it couldn't be. Because well, I, so I believe it, Stanton, but what I'm saying is, I mean, I, I, you know, when I get these people, like I had a lady out in the uh, middle of Pennsylvania, and she says, well, the aliens are here right now, when I called her. And I said, well, I want to speak with him. And she says, wait a minute. And she said, he wants to speak with you. And uh, I hear in a, in a background something, some noise. I mean, you know. And she says, they are here to take my soul, is what they said. And she sent me some pictures. I mean, we were really cool. I mean, you know, <laughs> I love them. But again, I called her back about a couple months later. And the phone was, you know, the phone was disconnected or whatever. And I, you know, I'm a private investigator too, so I can run background mm -hmm. checks and that. And I ran her, and she had died about two weeks after I talked to her. Mm -hmm. now, I find that very odd that she said the aliens are there to take her soul, and then she dies. And she passes mm -hmm. away. Wow. So, I mean, so could this actually be happening? Well, I suppose that anything is possible. Um, they, they say that after they die, then their spirit or their soul or their consciousness goes back uh, to their extraterrestrial origin. Right. Then we, we have a case too where. Uh, again, I don't know if this has anything to do with abductions, but we're finding a lot of UFOs are hovering over graveyards and are actually shooting the light down in there. Oh. Okay, now, um, one of the guys from West Virginia, what's his name, Teets? Yeah, Teets. Teets and them got a case back in, in the 60s 
whereas every time a body was buried, with the next day, that there would be a UFO there the next night, and it would have its light down in there. And people say, well, they're taking um, whatever they put in you or whatever. But then a couple people made the statement, well, it's very possible that they're actually bringing them out. If you remember how... Oh, the, 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 that's your Men in Black The Men in Black look back in the day. I mean, they had uh, stuff all over their face. Like they the had makeup. red lipstick yeah. on. And, yes. and the clothing that they wore was actually clothing they put on the dead people. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you say, that we don't know course. everything, but it, it's very interesting when you start looking at what these things are doing. I well, a very interesting story involving Betty and Barney Hill is after Barney's death in 1969, uh, and it was in the, the spring of the year, uh, Betty is traveling one night and she sees a UFO and uh, sh it, it's a close encounter and she's trying to send the message to them. She thinks that they're wondering where Barney is and she mm -hmm. says that Barney has died. And then she receives phone calls from the people who live next to the cemetery where Barney is buried and they say that there's, they have seen UFOs hovering over the cemetery. And then the report comes in that there is a, a shallow area where Barney's grave was. So then the question is, is his casket still there? Is his body still there? We really don't know. That's interesting. I, I, yeah, far I out, that. but well, exciting. Yeah. Yes, it is far out. One of the things I've read also, because uh, my experience was very malevolent, and I, so I've read a lot of books over the last two years, and what they've said in near-death experience, uh, alien abduction, and... and anything that was demonic was that if you survive it <laughs> you know and if you don't end up in an insane asylum that it has a positive effect and that it changes your thought process you no longer are worried about trivial things investing money it's a, you start having a global outlook a universal outlook you know what's best for mankind let you know universal <laughs> knowledge you know stuff like that do you find that with your abductees is that they become less self-centered and more of the big picture the really big picture the real ones, yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, it does seem that they begin to view themselves as members of the world, mm -hmm. of humankind, and not as individuals uh, in, in the manner that they had previously. They tend to become more spiritual, but those who have had religious faith tend to practice their religion too, I have found. Yeah, and, and you know, I've heard that it's almost, uh, maybe this is the next step in evolution, is to go through one of these type of encounters and, and your brain actually changes mm -hmm. and it becomes evolutionary where you're almost more telepathic, more perceptive, and it's the next step, but you have to go through this first and survive it to become this new type of human. Yes, and my research has indicated that individuals who have been taken uh, are returned more telepathic, yeah, they get, more intuitive, yeah. some become psychic. Mm -hmm. It very, yes. it, I mean, it, it's very interesting stuff, yes, Dan? Well, look, uh, well, let's face something here. In the last 50 years, we've certainly seen how our technology has evolved. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at uh, Moore's Law. The number of uh, transistors you can fit on a chip doubles every year or two. Yeah. And after 40 years, that's a lot of doubling. Right. You know? right. Okay, that's in the physical world, uh, electrons and stuff like that. But we need to understand that there's this whole world of, I'll call it the mental world, because I don't know what else to call it, where we still are ignorant, right. where we haven't made that progress, we haven't gone the next step to make this part of everybody's life. It's not something you learn in school, in other words, how to be psychic and so mm -hmm. forth. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's a world of consciousness, call it what you want, uh, that is not fully explored and is something that the academics don't want to explore mm -hmm. for the most part because it upsets our notion of our self-importance, where we're going with, with things. So I think we're at a time of changes going on in here as well as in our iPads. Right. You know? mm -hmm. So we, we need to recognize that we don't know all there is to know yet. Yet, yet. It, and we need it, a new scientific par paradigm because when you talk about science, you're thinking about materialist scientific Right, uh, and grant money and what they paradigm. can repeat and prove. Yes. They don't want to speculate, yes. you know, and then you lose your grant money if you do that. Uh, one more question. I'll be quiet. Uh, interdimensional. Mm -hmm. Okay. These things are capable of interdimensional travel, probably. Some. Huh? Some of them. Some I'm of not them, quite yeah. sure what that means. Going through walls? Okay. Yeah, right, right. 
is that interdimensional? I suppose it's things fitting together where there's right. a lot of space and you get a U or not you making get a the trip from a star system 4.3 light years yeah. away that they're actually in dimensions around us and can come through it. Right. Or say for example, <clears throat> a ship. I'm asking you, a ship can come down into the water. Okay, they see it going into the water. Well, the water is only 30 feet, and then the ship just vanishes in there. Would, it, would that be interdimensional, where it could actually go through the, 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 I mean? There's a whole book about over a thousand unidentified submerged objects, mm -hmm. USOs. Yeah. Yeah. Is that call find out of Delaware? Yeah. That's my guy. <laughs> I have yeah. Delaware, too. <laughs> and, and who knows what's going on down there? I don't think they're there for a fish dinner. Let, let me ask you this. Now, when I went to Scotland a couple of months ago and talked about oh, this, um, one of the things I read is that Freud said there are normal and abnormal people, where Carl Jung, Jung said, okay. Jung, yeah, yeah. said that there are normal people and supernormal people with different capacities. When I went to Scotland, and we had a four-hour lunch with the Scottish Paranormal Society, Brian Allen, Rich Ritchie, and, and I, and we talked about, you know, where does all of this originate from? The one guy, Brian Allen, said, what it, you are manifesting it through the power of your brain. There are no aliens, they're not from space, there are no uh, demons, there are no angels. You're creating this with positive, negative energy. You know, and, and the psycho psychiatrist will say, it's all lodged in your brain, nothing else happens. You know, and if we could find a place that we can take that part out. Or I look at the brain as the computer and the software as the soul and that mind separate, you know? Well, Do you think we create the things? I don't think so. I, I, I think we have to recognize these things are seen on radar. Yeah. Uh, we have, Ted Phillips has collected over 4,000 physical trace cases from 80 countries. Same thing keeps happening all over, even with footprints. Mm -hmm. And 6% involve reports of beings, little guys typically, associated with the craft. That's the real world out there. When the Air Force sends planes up to try to shoot them down, that's a real world. They're not responding to some mental construct. So I'm not saying there aren't people with mental difficulties. That's a different <laughs> question. But is that the only explanation? No. I'm saying we're dealing with a real phenomena. And because I worked on far out space stuff, nuclear stuff in particular, I don't see any big obstacle except spending the money that goes with uh, getting out there. And you know, look at the progress that, that's been made. Look at your computers today. Look how we went from Magellan. Go around the world, his ship took three years. The space station does it in 95 minutes. It's not just a big sailing boat, you understand. Technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. We do not know all there is to know. I don't Thanks. think we ever will. There'll be new discoveries right. made. One, one more question for Kat. Okay. Now you know what my specialty is. Have you ever heard a person that's been abducted on a spacecraft say they've seen a Bigfoot on that craft? I actually did uh, a scientific study, uh, as, as scientific as possible, uh, quantitative information on the types of beings they saw on the craft, and there were a couple of individuals who stated that they saw these hairy uh, beings Big. as well. So, Bigfoot. yes. <laughs> Go ahead. And they, uh, I, I didn't say Bigfoot because I thought. Oh, yeah, well, we don't know there is a Bigfoot, so we're just saying hairy being. Beings, but yeah, yes. hairy being, yeah. Okay. Okay. We're out of time again, so last statement. Give us your final statement and your final statement, and we're done again. <laughs> we're dealing with a big subject here. There's no question in my mind that the Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft, that we're dealing with a cosmic Watergate. Some few people in government know what's going on, not all and that it's the biggest story of the millennium. And I'm looking forward to the future because maybe we'll answer some of the questions we still have. Very good. There is credible evidence that this is real. You only need to go to the archival collections, to the government files to find that information for yourself. It's also in our books. And uh, I think that once you start to read this, you're going to be hooked just as all of us have been. Yeah. It's incredibly interesting. And uh, also, you can visit my website at Kathleen-Marden.com and Stanton's at StantonFriedman.com for information, for articles that you can read that we have written about our work, for our upcoming speaking engagements, and to purchase autographed copies of our books. 
Yep, and I'm johnventry.com, and you're on Facebook on a number of sites, right? Right, yeah. You don't have a website, do you, Fred? No, we have West Virginia Center for Unexplained Events, uh, Fayette County, Pennsylvania, Bigfoot Research Project, Mountain State, uh, Sasquatch Watch. And if you didn't know it, you were just interviewed by the James Bond of Fayette Nam, with a different hat, and the Donald Trump of, just... and the Donald Trump of ufology. <laughs> so how you like that? And that's our yeah, show. Yeah, beat that. <laughs>